Hi, I'm Brian Hernandez, and you're listening to The Chef's Corner, where we sit down with chefs and pizzaiolos from around the world and talk about business, life, and pizza. Hello, and welcome to The Chef's Corner. I'm your host, Brian Hernandez, and today I get to corner the one, the only, the great Mr. Peter Reinhardt. How are you doing today, Peter? Hey, I'm great, Brian. How are you? Oh, very, very good. Very excited about what we're going to get ready to talk about and just kind of pick your brain for all that baking wisdom that, uh, you know, you've got in that repository up there. So um, I did want to say that uh, you have just uh, come out with another book, I believe, right? I have. Well, I know because there it is right there. And I have it. So we are, <laughs> we're twins here. Yeah, I'm excited it's about it. It's my second pizza book. It's my 12th book. Most of my other books are uh, on bread. Mm -hmm. or uh, sort of food and culture. Um, but 15 years ago, I wrote American Pie, my mm -hmm. for the perfect pizza. That was my, my initial pizza book. But this new one is really more of a cookbook uh, of my method for doing pan pizzas, which is everything from Detroit style to Sicilian to focaccia, schiacciata. Uh, and I just am giving my take on it. I think it's a hot category right now. So let's just kind of jump into all these questions. And it's uh, tradition is uh, we usually start with the easy question. Um, what is your earliest pizza memory? What was the first time you remember anything about pizza? Smell? Yeah, I remember. Flavor. I'm, I mean, I'm, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm, uh, I'm in my uh, late 60s now. So, so I have to reach back a long way. When I was a kid, maybe six, seven years old, we found a pizzeria near where I was living in just outside of Philadelphia in, a, in what was then a very rough neighborhood, a scary part of town called Maniunk, which is now a very hot um, sort of uh, uh, you know, revitalized neighborhood with lots of good restaurants. But back then, there was this one little pizza joint called Mama's Pizzeria. It was a mom and pop operation. Uh, Paul Castellucci was the pizza maker. Somehow my folks heard about it. Uh, we decided to go across the river to the danger danger zone uh, <laughs> and try it out. And, of course, fell in love with pizza and became regulars there. And Paul s pretty much adopted us and you know, because we were some of his you know, most regular uh, customers and brought lots of people to him. And later on, as his business grew and expanded to uh, new locations, uh, closer even to where we lived, on our side of the river, um, we stayed in touch, and I even worked for him for a while as a delivery boy. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me uh, say one thing that's really important to me about pizza and why I think pizza is the most popular food in the world, because we teach at the culinary schools, and I've taught at a number of culinary schools, but I've been at Johnson & Wales for 20 years now. Uh, I teach all my students that the single most important thing that they have to learn to do while they're paying all this money to be in a culinary school is their, their customers want them to deliver one thing, and that is flavor. Whoever delivers the most flavor wins. They have to learn how to do it in a safe way, you know, a way that uh, doesn't endanger the customers because they're trusting them to put food in their mouth. That has to be beautiful and presented well. But people don't pay for safe food. They don't pay for presentations. They pay for flavor. And flavor is what brings them back for more. Well, what is the most perfect flavor delivery system in the world? It's dough with something on it or dough with something in it. Why are sandwiches and why are pizzas universally the, the most consumed foods? They deliver flavor. And so now we find pizza, pizza operators who have learned how to deliver not just flavor, but flavor that's memorable. So my, my definition of a great pizza as opposed to a good pizza is, is it memorable? And so I'm always looking for what are the components that allow a dish to become memorable. So uh, how did you get started in the baking business? And it must be good for you because you said you're in your late 60s and you wear it well, my friend. Um, well, thank you. I, we could all be so lucky if we, if we have the vibrance that you have. But, um, I mean, 12 books, um, pizzaquest.com. Don't you have a hand in a pizzeria as well? Well, I've consulted for a number of pizzerias, and sometimes I'll come in as a consulting partner and get a piece of equity. But typically what I do is, is that I just sell them back the equity <clears throat> because that way I can move on. So I kind of felt like it was better to have my independence and just you know be available to anybody who wants me to come in and help them either do a better version or help them get into the game itself and, and figure out essentially what I can help them with is uh, the, the crust, the dough. Mm -hmm. Because I think that the, 
the joy of pizza, 80% to 90% of what makes a pizza great is the crust. The toppings, the cheese, uh, forgive me all you cheese sponsors and tomato sponsors, it's an important part of the pizza. We love it, it makes pizza pizza, but if you don't have a great crust, in my opinion, it doesn't matter how good the toppings are. If you have a great crust, you can put any kind of toppings on and it's gonna be, it could be memorable. If you have memorable toppings but a mediocre crust, you're just going to have an interesting pizza, but not a memorable pizza. So I focus on the crust development. And of course, my background as a bread baker helps with that. And, and I really learned my craft uh, as a longtime member of the Bread Bakers Guild of America, where a lot of the European techniques and secrets were brought to this country about 25 years ago, as uh, a number of artisan bakeries were emerging. And I got to be part of that early wave of the renaissance of bread in the United States. And now we're seeing that a lot of the wisdom that was accumulated by the guild is now being shared with the pizza community. And a lot of pizza makers who are also bread bakers, because really pizza is bread, but they're also some of them were already in the bread business, uh, are now moving into the pizza business. And pizza mm -hmm. operators are trying to find out what the bread people know that can help improve their pizzas. So there's been a, kind of a coming together of those two worlds. Well, and um, so early on, was I mean, was when did you know you wanted to do baking i mean was there just something that clicked or you walked into a bakery and said i can do this <laughs> interestingly enough i did not uh, ever imagine that i would you know be a baker as a as a trade as as my livelihood uh, i started out actually as a filmmaker and a uh, communications mm -hmm. major in college i was a broadcasting and film major uh planned to go into film i wanted to write and direct films um and i then I kind of fell in with a group of hippies back in the 60s who were doing an organic vegetarian restaurant, which was a very avant-garde thing back then. And I fell in love with that life and also learned how to cook in the kitchen on the job. I didn't even make the breads there. We had The breads were made by another hippie bakery around the corner. So I just used to go over and pick up the bread. And I would watch those guys working with natural leavenings and whole grains. And, and it got me interested, but it wasn't what I was doing. We were making the entrees and cooking. I mean, we, we taught ourselves how to cook at this restaurant, but I realized I'm loving this. And uh, prior to, you know, leaving the film school, I, I said, you know, I can make films, but I really don't know what I have to say. I need to go out and find out really what my mission in life is and what I believe and, and, you know, kind of find myself. And I found myself through the food world and little by little. And then eventually I actually joined a, uh, a Christian uh, community that included ordinations for ministry and priesthood and and uh, and I was on a track to be uh, a minister and wow. and I still consider myself in a sense a minister even though I'm no longer part of that seminary but while I was there training for the priesthood and the ministry um, I also ended up as the cook in the seminary because I was one of the people who had prior cooking experience and uh, it was in San Francisco where I, uh, I kind of got fascinating with bread because San Francisco is the bread epicenter of the United States. And I decided to just try to make some. And one thing led to another and I got like a lot of bread bakers who stumbled into it. I just, I got so deep into it that I couldn't get out. <laughs> I loved it, fell in love with it. And, and, and then I got married to a, another, in a, within our community, we had both married couples and we had a monastic branch. So the householder branch included families and, and, uh, and couples and my wife was also a good cook so we started a restaurant and bakery in sonoma county uh back in 1986 uh, that uh where we made our own bread because by then i had become a pretty good bread baker not again thinking the bread would could be my life but um the bakery took off the breads that i was creating there were pretty original unique and suddenly i went hey now i know what i want to write about and i now know you know, what my message is, and I'm telling the story of our breads uh, as a metaphor of my own personal journey. And then it just got, kept going, it kept going, and, and the Bread Bakers Guild came along, and we started to get science and put that together, and I found that with my writing background, um, I was good at explaining it, and it led to a number of books, and uh, 12 books later, I'm, uh, I'm still telling the stories. Well, that's, um, that is quite a journey. <laughs> It's been, it's been, uh, a long and winding road, as they say. <laughs> now I've been uh, looking through this book, and there, um, there are a lot of great recipes in here. And, and as you said, 
Um, oh, and I did want to show everybody who is watching this video. This is my absolute favorite picture. <laughs> it's funny. I marked the exact same page in my book. Look at this. It, yeah. Just right here. Chrome right. structure on this is like, it's, I don't know. It's just a, worth the photographer taking that picture did a great job. Yeah. I love, I love that shot because it captures the, uh, the glow of the undercrust, which mm -hmm. is what is really the key to this, to this kind of, this is from a Detroit style pizza, which yeah. I think is the star of the book. And I think what makes that pizza so hot right now and, and makes it the star of the star pizza of the day is this, this crackly buttery undercrust that shatters in your mouth like a piece of toffee and just fills your mouth with buttery goodness. And then uh, followed by all the, the wonderful flavors uh, that, that come behind it. So um, as you said, you know, I guess it's just your, your uh, writing background makes it, you're good at being able to explain this. And there are a lot of recipes and I, um, I don't know if you had a collaboration with somebody, but I mean, how, what inspires the recipes that you are putting in this pizza book? With my background on the baking side, I have a lot of theories and I have a lot of ideas of what makes for a great crust because again, it starts with the crust. It's all about the crust as far as I'm concerned. And so a lot of it has to do with long, cold fermentation, slow, better than fast, um, and proper heat, and everything pizza makers already know about, uh, sort of the, the balancing act of time, temperature, and ingredients to create the optimum flavor experience. Um, so so uh, for me, as I was working on this book, there are certainly many pizzerias already with terrific topping ideas and and ways of presenting their pizzas. But I wanted to include some of the classics, like a Detroit red stripe pizza has to be part of a, a chapter on Detroit pizzas and pepperoni uh, pizzas with you know lots of cool stuff on it. Uh, but I also wanted to create some original ideas that may or may not exist in other pizzerias, but that came out of my mind. And the inspiration for that really is, is our sandwiches. Because I define a pizza as dough with something on it. And I define a sandwich as dough with something in it. They're really kissing cousins. They're, you know, and there's so much similarity uh, between sandwiches and pizzas and so much influence already between those in terms of flavor ideas um, that I thought, you know, what I'm going to do is, is kind of mine that category of, of my favorite sandwiches. Like a, I grew up in Philadelphia, so a Philly cheesesteak is a no-brainer. It has to be in this book. A Philly cheesesteak pizza. I've seen pizzerias that do that. But I wanted to, uh, you know, bring my ethic, and I have a favorite cheesesteak place that inspires me that I that I write and talk about a lot, uh, called Mamas. The same Mamas that did the pizzas also happens to make the best cheesesteak in Philadelphia, in my opinion. And so, and so, uh, you know, I use that as my inspiration. There's Philly's also famous for roast pork sandwiches, and so um, you know, we don't see too many roast pork sandwich pizzas. So I kind of. Uh, engineered my own version of how to do that and to bring the flavor experience of those great sandwiches and others like them, a BLT, obviously, a Reuben. There's so many sandwiches that are great. to use that and do a pizza version of them. And that's just one aspect and one way to get inspired. There's certainly others. You, you know, um, I've seen a number of pizzerias that features uh, spaghetti and meatballs on top of a pizza. And uh, it seems almost like overkill but when it's done right and tastefully it's pretty cool and we have a great really? picture in the book of our version of a spaghetti and meatball pizza and it turns out that a lot of people got pretty excited about that one i give uh recipes because a lot of my readers are also home cooks and the nice thing about the pan pizzas uh as opposed to say the neapolitan pizzas which really require a very hot oven um these can be baked at 475 to 500 degrees in a home oven uh, you don't need any special tools for that. You can bake them in, in brownie pans. You can get special Detroit-style two-inch pans. You can get uh, uh, round cake pans. You can bake them in anything as long as the, the walls are high enough to handle the cheese kind of flowing over the side and melting down and making the frico. Doing everything that you've done as far as restaurant side of the business, uh, what's your favorite ingredient? It doesn't have to be a pizza topping because I know you've delved into lots of different things, but what's your absolute favorite ingredient? The first dish that my mom ever made for me that kind of blew my mind was Caesar salad when I was hmm. about nine or 10 years old. And the flavor combination of a classic Caesar dressing, we learned how to make it by going to a restaurant and watch the guy make it table side. And we came home and made it ourselves. She made it first and taught me how to do it. It became like a two or three times a week, I would be the Caesar salad maker 
at our home dinners at the dinner table. And there was something about that flavor combination of, of the, the acidity of the lemon and vinegar, the uh, umami aspect of the uh, anchovies, the olive oil, the, you know, the, the garlic, the Parmesan cheese. I mean, those flavors came together in a way that totally changed my relationship with food. I mean, back in the 60s, very few people knew what Caesar salad was. Now everybody knows. Right. But back then, it was, it was a breakthrough dish for me. So those the ingredients in there, I would say, again, I didn't think about it very deeply. I just knew that if I threw it all together in a wooden bowl and you know mixed it all up and added some romaine lettuce and Parmesan cheese, I could uh, I could rock people and uh, and that got me going. Well, that's uh, yeah, that's definitely I'll I'll give you that one. I'll allow it. Um, <laughs> I do. It's on more than other... one ingredient, but it. Uh... <laughs> well, I, you know, I mean, if you want to call it dressing, the Caesar dressing, yeah. it's an ingredient. Yes. You're right, and some of it has to do with the garnishing. For instance, a hoagie, which is a great sandwich, a submarine sandwich, is wonderful. But if you don't put some acid on it, if you don't have a secret sauce that goes on it to bring out the the flavors that are sort of trapped in the lettuce and the tomatoes and the onions, but tie them all together and make them pop in your mouth, uh, it's just a sandwich. But when you add uh, you know, some kind of a dressing, whether it's a vinaigrette, like they do at Subway, where they just splash oil and vinegar and some herbs, or you make your own secret sauce like a lot of Philadelphia hoagie shops do, um, that is really the secret to the hoagie more than it is the salamis and the capicola and everything else. And the bread is, of course, a big part of that as well. What is um, one ingredient that you'll never use, something that you just can't stand? <laughs> Ingredient-wise now, I think the probably my single most despised dish are string beans, green beans that have been overcooked, boiled green beans instead of, you know, like al dente. If you cook them right, it's a thing of beauty. You overcook them, you might as well just put them in the compost heap. Well, that puts me at odds with half of the people in the region where I live in the southeast who love, you know, heavily boiled green beans, but I just don't get it. It's, it's mush at that point. Mush. No, that's a, that's a good answer. Is there one ingredient that you haven't played around with yet um, in your culinary adventures that you really want to try? Something that's maybe new on the horizon or just something that you've never had a chance to work with? I haven't tasted yet this uh, new uh, Impossible Burger non-meat meat. Oh, yeah. uh, there's two, two versions of it. There's what Impossible Burger and there's another one, another brand. And I think they're showing up now like at fast food places even. I think uh, Burger King and McDonald's both are doing, doing them and I've heard that they're available. So I want to taste them because I'm curious. Uh, I have played in the past with veggie burgers. I've created my own versions of vegetarian, you know, hamburgers or, uh, you know, burgers. Uh, I even created once a tofu hot dog just because I wanted to try. Uh, <laughs> and I happen to be one of the few people who actually likes tofu. But um, that was a tough one. That was a challenge. But, um, but I want to see what this is like um, because, again, what they're dealing with is they're trying to create a flavor compound in a texture that approximates the texture of hamburger or ground beef. And, and so if they can create, put all that together and people like it, and if it's good for you, if it's nutritious, and if it, if it does help with, uh, you know, with the carbon emissions and all of that, then, you know, I want to give it a fair shot. And, uh, and, but again, it's all about, does it deliver flavor and, and uh, what are the long-term impacts of that? And, I, and it looks like, you know, it's got a bright future though. People are, are buying in. Yep, definitely. Like you said, it's that perfect delivery system. Um, so now we've talked about what you like, what you don't, what you'd like to mess around with. Um, this is going to bring us to the dreaded Scott Wiener's lightning round. <laughs> now, that's not really that. It always makes him sound bad, but it's not. Uh, basically, I I'm love gonna... Scott, though. I'll, I'll, I'll take his lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you like three questions or uh, three um, ingredients. I'm not going to make them too crazy, but some might be crazy. And uh, just tell me how you would incorporate it, and preferably into a pizza. But if not a pizza, at least a dish of Ooh some kind like so it's, you know desk. it's good because you do have a, a culinary background there um i'm gonna just throw you some crazy curveball on this one baked beans mm -hmm. i haven't used that one it's been staring me in the, in the face so i want to see what you would do with baked beans on a pizza let's try that first if you can okay so baked beans if they come out of a can with that sort of molasses like quality to it as opposed to just yeah like what we as opposed to just beans so baked beans with that flavor profile well you know, I when I think of baked beans, the the first image I have is how well it goes, not only with like hot dogs and hamburgers, but 
but with uh, with barbecue. I would probably do it with shredded pork or or shredded beef. Uh, I'd acidify the beans a little bit with with either uh, some some uh, some vinegar and uh, and make a sauce. You know, and make and make a sauce that drizzles over the top of all that on the, and bake it on the pizza. So you get the the meat. You get the, the 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 beans and then the acidity of the sauce texture. It's like it's so soft that it goes back to that mushy quality. So if you're going to have it, then you need something to counterbalance it. So you need something with some crunch. I probably put some sprinkle some uh, fresh onions on top of that as well, you know, or pickles or something that gives you a crunch factor to counterbalance the uh, the soft texture of the beans. There's acid and pickles plus crunch. You get two two wins with a pickle. <laughs> okay, let's um. Let's move over. Let's just do an easy one. Uh, portobello mushrooms. Uh, portobello mushrooms. Uh, well, of course, I love portobello mushrooms. And, uh, and they're really just a big overgrown cremony mushroom. It's a full size. You know, so, so typically, uh, there's a good ingredient to kind of treat as if it's a meat replacement because it's like the size of a burger. So probably marinate it a little bit in some nice uh, uh, seasonings, maybe a little bit of uh, Worcestershire, possibly some soy. Um, Garlic, um, again, uh, vinegar it can be either balsamic or it can be red wine vinegar, any kind of vinegar. Uh, depends on you know what your flavor profiles. Marinate it all, and then and then grill it uh, uh, in hot oil fast to kind of set a little bit of a of a crust or a skin on it. Flip it over, um, and yet keep the center still soft and meaty. And then uh, uh, for now, for putting it on a pizza, then of course I probably have to cut that into strips. And scatter them a little bit, and then what would I do? I'd probably just melt some. Uh, I mean, I, I some people don't like to mix mushrooms and um, and cheese together, but I do. I put some Swiss cheese or Gruyere over the top of that, and, uh, and make that my pizza. Very nice. That's um, close to what I competed with in Italy, where really? I beat the whole U.S. pizza team. Well, there you go. So um, I'm getting into your head very, now. <laughs> yeah. Well, me and Daniel it was a I mean, Daniel come up with and him being a vegetarian. I wanted something that he could taste and yeah, and that's what we why we're going with the mushrooms. And I did the same thing. I made it that meat substitute and, and sauteed it in Worcestershire, you know, Worcestershire sauce. And, wow. And yeah, um, yeah. I mean, very very similar to what you had described. So fantastic. Well, I feel like I'm that I that I stumbled into a good idea there. <laughs> Bonus points on that one. All right. Prove it. A proven idea. <laughs> right. Right. Yep. Pickled pineapples. Pickled pineapples. Wow. Wow. So there we got a little bit of sweet and acid. Now, the, one of the things that I learned when I was uh, creating a my version of a Hawaiian pizza for the new book is, of course, it's a very polarizing pizza, right? You've got people who, who get outraged by even the idea of it, but they, I don't think they know the origin story, and I learned that a little bit. It was not created in Hawaii. It was created in Canada, by a, a Canadian who had worked, he wasn't even Chinese, but he had worked in Chinese restaurants, and he was fascinated with the notion of the flavor um, experience of sweet and, and, and acid fruits, the acid fruit being the pineapple, uh, and, uh, and then and then sweet and sour and sweet and spicy, that whole Asian flavor profile. So then he enter, you know, introduced the idea of whether it was Canadian ham or Canadian bacon or, or just ham on, on a pizza, or just bacon and pineapple. And he made these pizza, and he called it Hawaiian pizza because the pineapple was on it, not because it originated in Hawaii. So he was on to something. When I hear uh, pickled uh, pineapple, I, I, I think we're already going to get the sweet, we're going to get the acid, so I'd like to get some spice in there. So I would definitely get some, maybe some spicy Italian or, or Portuguese or Mexican sausage. It could be chorizo. It could be anything that has a nice spice combination that would uh, contrast because that's another culinary principle that we teach our students is that uh, besides texture is contrast, flavor contrast, and, um, and also uh, textural contrast. So uh, the contrast of spice with sweet, you know, basically you get more than the sum of its parts. So I, I could see just max, mixing that with some real nice spicy sausage. All right. That's, a, that's another great answer right there. Hope you're taking notes for the next book. <laughs> so, um, there are no losers in the Scott Wiener's lightning round, but you win. So, um, <laughs> I, I, win. 
<laughs> boy, we'll be sending you your gift of uh, the bread capital of the world of the U.S. Oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah, so look for that in the mail. It's cash on delivery, though. Uh, again, part of the chef's corner is that you have to give me a recipe that we put in the magazine, publish, and then we make a video uh, to show everybody, consumers and professionals, how to make this. So you've given? Uh, do you know which recipe we're getting from you? I think we the Motor City Hawaiian. I think would be cool. We call it, I call it the Motor City Hawaiian because it's a Detroit pizza done in the Hawaiian pizza style. One of the techniques in the book that differentiates it from everybody else's version of a Detroit style pizza is what I call the embedded cheese technique that we that I developed. It's really an original technique. I haven't seen any pizzeria use this technique, and it's based on the idea of taking half of the cheese and putting it over the surface of the dough once you've got it in the pan, and then giving the dough about four to five hours at room temperature to rise slowly, and it embeds that cheese in the crust itself. Then before you bake it, you put the rest of the cheese and the other toppings on, and so you get basically a, a nicely topped pizza, but the crust itself has a quality that I've never seen in any other pizza crust. We get that great bottom caramel, you know, toffee-like bottom, but then you get a creamy custard-like, crumb of the of the of the dough and then of course the crispy cheese edge around the outside the frico they call it and then the the beauty of whatever toppings we put on top so i'm really looking forward to finding out if you have that same experience when you make it for uh you know for this test there's no end of ideas and i work in a culinary institute with you know lots of talented chefs so i'm being inspired all the time by watching them cook as all of us are and you know, sometimes I'll get a great idea just watching, you know, the Food Network or one of the other, uh, our Top Chef, um, because the, there's an endless fount of creativity out there. What made you decide to do a pan pizza book this time? I mean, is it, Yeah. Did you, did you think it's not well understood or known? I mean, Detroit is now coming out of its closet, but uh, I mean, I grew up in the Midwest, so we always kind of knew what it was, but now the rest of the world is, or country's yeah. catching on. Yeah. Um, did you figure it was time to out some more of these and let people know how good a uh, pan pie can be? Yeah, I think that was part of it because as a, I, sometimes I get to judge at pizza competitions and I noticed that sometimes, uh, if they offer a, uh, uh, non-traditional or anything goes category that more and more of those entries were coming in as Detroit style yeah. uh, or square pizzas or however, and I, and I gave the, the term deep and pizza as opposed to deep dish, which I think of as Chicago style. But the deep pan pizzas, like Detroit style, were showing up more and more, and there was a reason, because people were discovering how good they can really be when they're well properly done. And so I did to have a, a consulting gig uh, with uh, a restaurant that wanted to add Detroit style pizza to their menu, because they were inspired by the ones that they had at Jeff Smokovich's Brown Dog Pizza mm. in Telluride, Colo uh, Telluride Colorado. Um, I put him with Sean Rondazzo as two of the real superstars of this style. The, the, my goal was, uh, from the client, make a pizza as good as the one at Brown Dog um, so that I can put it on my menu. And we're not a pizzeria, so we have to be able to do it in a regular restaurant oven. I have to be able to work it into my menu without dropping anything from the menu. There was a lot of challenges for it. But the first thing, the first challenge was to come up with one that really impressed them. So I said, what are you looking for? How will I know when I've achieved what you're looking for since it's in your mind and not mine? <laughs> and he said, he said, I am looking for the wow factor. He said, I want to be wowed by this pizza when I taste it. And when I'm wowed, you'll know it. And we spent four or five days of making prototypes and he would say, it's good, but I'm not wowed. It's good. And, and so I said, my job is to get you to wow. And he said, that's it. You got to get me to wow. And, um, uh, and then on the seventh day, no, well, it was the sixth day, because on the seventh day, we figured out how to do it in the restaurant, and we rested on the seventh day. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did rest on the seventh day. But, but on the sixth day, we nailed it. And, and I saw the light go off in his eye when he took a bite. And he, um, and I actually, I've, I'm gonna, my next book is going to be all about sort of like, how do you get recipes to wow? You know, he's, he got this look in his eye, and I saw a tear actually form in the corner of his eye as he's chewing this piece of pizza and he's just looking at it and he's not saying anything. And I'm, and I said, is that wow? And he, and he, he looks up at me and he goes, and he kind of whispers and he goes, it's sex. No. I said, that's even better than wow. Right. He says, Oh yeah. <laughs> he said, that's going on the menu. 
and next day All we right. figured out how to get it into his into his operation. And three months they spent working out the logistics of how to make it work within that restaurant operation. His goal was to do sixty a day uh, as a, as an additional menu item, and he would have been very happy at sixty. And within a month they were doing one hundred and twenty. Wow. Okay. That is. And it all came down to the wow came uh, from when we made the breakthrough with the embedded cheese. And again, that, and that wasn't something that Smokovich or anybody else is doing, but that's what made it work. And that's when I got the idea for the book. And I realized this whole category of pan pizzas is ready to explode when it's done at the level that we just came up with. And so uh, my publisher agreed, and that's how I came up with perfect pan pizzas. And so I'm, so I, so I, this is, this is now my new benchmark uh, of what the pizza experience can be. I feel like I pushed this, you know, to a new place. Um, and it can be done. My focaccia I've been big on for a number of years, and I have in the book my method for focaccia. I'm, I'm going to try next time I get a chance, I'm going to try to do one with the embedded cheese technique as well to see if I can push it to yet another level. But, uh, but it takes a lot of cheese to do a, like a sheet pan of focaccia. With the, with the Detroit pizzas, we can make them small, you know, and, and, and you don't have to invest as much in the cheese part. But it's just something about it. So, yes, this is now my new favorite style. Well, uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't have you trapped in the chef's corner here and ask you a little bit about baking. Baking's a science. We all know it. And you get your baker's for cents, and it's all very mathematical and scientific. How important is it to stick to the numbers? Is there room for improvisation? Or, uh, you know, it, it, once you get it locked in, you just got to leave it. Make sure you hit the same amounts, weights, yeah. temps. Well, I think that, again, when starting with the, with the dough, you know, where, where it all begins, there's a lot of ways to make a great crust. There's no one way only. And a lot of it is based on which flour you're choosing to use. If you have a, you have a particular brand loyalty or you've, you've discovered a flour that you love, then you conform all the other ingredients to the flour. How much water, the hydration level is so critical. The, the salt is typically somewhere around 2% of the flour weight. Some people like to go 25 some people like to go 1.8. So you find, you know, you play with that and you have to play with all of these. How much oil do you want to put in, if any? Um, and that will de be dependent upon what temperature you're going to bake that at. There's so many factors. So you play with this. And then uh, what bakers have learned to do, and pizza makers now are learning it as well, is how to write a formula in terms of percentages of ingredients as opposed to weights. Because once you have the formula, then you know that the flour equals 100% because that's, the flour is always the 100% ingredient, and everything else is a ratio against the flour. So if, if it's 2% salt, then you know that no matter what size batch, you can run the weight, multiply it by 2%, and that's how much salt you're going to put in. Right. Baker's percent, the baker's percent. Yeah, and, I'm, and, and I use that religiously. And I wanted to ask you, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I got in an argument with someone here in the office that um, – it changes that like you're saying 2% of whatever your flour weight is always going to be 2%. Sometimes they're saying, well, no, it changes. It, it, the percentage gets a little off when you make, you know, go from a, a 10 pound batch to a 50 pound batch. I said, no, it's math. So 2% is always 2%. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's how they, that's how these bakers percents work. So, right. And, and, and one thing that can change the percentages might be altitude. It wouldn't necessarily affect the salt, but it might affect the water. And at high altitudes, like when I'm baking in Denver or higher, uh, uh, flour tends to be drier in, in higher altitudes. So sometimes I have to increase the water. So again, you tweak the recipe. And that goes back to the question, do I have to religiously stick to my numbers? I think it's important to understand how the numbers work, that every baker has to be able to adjust on the fly, because even flour can change. Uh, the same brand from year to year, depending on the harvest, might come in drier, it could be older, it could be younger, it could be all sorts of factors. So in the end, you have to let the dough talk to you. You have to let the dough, as you're mixing it, tell you if it needs any adjustments. And so you taste it. And sometimes the adjustments can be adding a little more water, could be adding a little more flour, and you usually don't have to change the salt or the oil, but, but then it might also be that you, everything was right, but the dough feels a little slack today. It's not quite as, as strong. So you can fix that by maybe doing a couple extra folds. You stretch and fold the dough a few times to approximate additional mixing time, and that strengthens the gluten network. And so you can. So the more sort of tricks that a baker has for adjusting, the more flexibility you have. 
So you, you might have to make some tweaks, but you should be in the ballpark. You should be very close to where you want to be, and the tweaks are just minor to kind of dial it in on that day. But if you're in a high you know, volume restaurant and you're producing this stuff and you have five or six employees, you have to know and you have to have a system in place that they will follow strictly or else you might as well fire them and do it yourself if you can't count on them to stick to the game plan. And I had to do that when I had my bakery. I had a very talented baker, but he was so sure of himself that he was constantly tweaking my recipes. And and when I would say, there's something different about this, what happened? He said, well, I made this little change and improvement. And I said, wait a second, it's no longer the bread that I gave you. If you're going to make a change, then talk to me first. Tell me what it is. We'll talk about it. I'm open to it. But don't go making changes in the system because then we're going to have a different product every day and the customers want you know, reliable and consistent. Yeah. yeah. And so those are issues. So you need to have uh, employees that are reliable, consistent, and then you can tell them. If you have an idea that you think you can do it better, we can either talk about it and, and, and uh, if, I, if you convince me, I'll make it, or I'll fund you to go open another pizzeria 10 miles from here, you know, which is how, if you think about it, that's how uh, Frank Pepe's and Sally's, two of the most famous pizzerias in America in New Haven, started out by Sal. Sal Consiglio was working for Frank Pepe, and he thought he could do it better than Frank. So Frank said, why don't you go open your own place? And he did, two blocks away. I know. And, and they, both pizzas were so good that now, 80 years later, both pizzerias are legendary, and they're still thriving. That's why Baker's Math is so valuable, because you can dial it in that way. Once you've dialed in and you found, based on your ethic of what you want, you can actually quantify it in a formula. Right. And you can make that formula any size and you keep everything in the same ratio. Mm. But and what is what, what is the most important factor when making your dough then? I mean, I know you had mentioned the flour. Is it like temperature, time of mixing, the formula itself? Well, um, I, it's all those things in a way. I, the way I explain it to my students is that ba- there's a, like, think of it as a triangle. I call it the baker's triangle. <laughs> And at the points of the triangle, you've got time, temperature, and ingredients. Mm-hmm. And, and in the middle is the bake, is baking. You know? and, 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 and these three cardinal points are all important factors in how it's going to turn out. If you change any one of those points, it's going to affect the other points. And, um, and so the, the temperature that you choose to use when you're baking it, for instance, or the temperature that the dough should be when it comes off the mixer, are all things that are variables, but, but controllable. But if you bake, uh, if, if your ingredients, if you add, let's say, sugar to your dough because you want it to be a little sweeter and you want more browning or something like that, it's also going to affect the temperature because you can't bake it as hot uh, if there's sugar in there because it will caramelize too quickly. And then uh, time, temperature, and ingredients. So then, again, the flour or uh, the other, whatever other ingredients you're putting in there, uh, and again, mostly it's flour, so that's important, the type of flour, the brand of flour, um, for the toppings, it's the same thing. You know, anything, it's all affected by these three cardinal points. So if you understand that it all happens within those, you can have a lot of flexibility. Just know that you have to adjust uh, you know, the other points mm. uh, based on what that product is, is teaching you. The pro- these products can teach us what they need if we're open to listen to it and we don't think that, you know, and, and if you're not locked into a dogma that says it must be done this way. My formula must be done according to the way I've written it, uh, but, I, but I can't be so dogmatic that I can't adjust if, if weather conditions or the brand or the flour comes in a little drier or wetter, you know, things like that. Kind of, I mean, it definitely sounds like it's all just all encompassing importance. And, it, and if you throw one thing in there, it can create chaos in the system. But the cool thing is, is that while baking is a lot of, has science involved in it, it's not rocket science. It's very learnable by any employee. Anybody can learn this. It's not trigonometry. It's just basic math. And, um, and so it's just being willing to get your mind around it. Uh, in the, in the uh, uh, let's say, manufactured food uh, world, a formula is written differently than the way we just described it. It's written so that all the ingredients add up to 100%. So the flour might be 60% of the total recipe uh, and the water might be 35%. And, you know, it's all, it looks different because it all adds up to 100. With baker's math, it starts at 100 with the flour. And if you have two kinds of flour, like, like whole wheat flour and bread flour, um, together they equal 100%. 
So it might be 90 and 10. It could be anything, but it's 100% flour. Then everything else is a ratio against that total flour weight. Mm-hmm. And that way, if you know, you know people that work with measuring cups and scoops, it can vary depending on how they pack, pack the flours, where if you're weighing it, it doesn't matter who's doing the scaling, a pound is a pound. Yeah, and that's the tricky part is when I get uh, recipes that, that require, they call for a cup or a teaspoon, and then I have to get off my butt, go out of the office, go to the kitchen, and weigh it just to make sure. I mean, there are websites out there that will do conversions for you. Yes. So yes. You, even even down to the different types of flour or granulated sugar and, and salt. But um, that's right. nothing beats weighing it for that first well, that's time. That's most accurate. You know. Most accurate. For, now, if you're working at home in a small batch and you you only need a teaspoon of powdered yeast, a teaspoon of powdered yeast, a level teaspoon, is you don't have to weigh it. It's going to be hard to find a scale that will get you like, you know, Point uh, uh, three, whatever you know. Uh, uh, I think you can get three grams on, uh, which is what a teaspoon will weigh. But but you know, sometimes you can go with teaspoons. But if, if you're in production, if you're in the professional uh, category, scaling is really essential. I think it's prof- it's the professional way to do it, as opposed to the uh, sort of hit and miss way mm-hmm. of doing. It. What is um number one tip for getting a best crumb structure like that light and airy uh, spider web inside? Um, is it is it going to be a higher hydration? Maybe your proofing time and temperature? Uh, yeah. How much time you leave it out at room temp before you refrigerate well, once it? Once again, it's it's all of those factors, but it, the 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 general answer is that it's understanding how fermentation works. And so one thing we know is that more more flavor can come out of the flour, the, the, the baker's job is to evoke the full potential of flavor trapped in the flour. Is that, and there's a lot of flavor trapped in there that you, doesn't emerge with a fast fermented dough. It's, it's all the sugars that are part of the starch matrix are trapped in the starches, where if, if you give it like say a long fermentation, it could be one day, but typically overnight, most pizzerias you know, stumbled into the understanding that an overnight dough ball is, is better tasting than a, a four-hour dough ball, um, but it's, there's a reason for it, and it's because the enzymes that are part of the flour makeup need time to break some of those small sugar chains free from the starch chains, and as they become broken free, they become accessible to the yeast because yeast needs it for food. They can't eat starch, but it can eat glucose. It becomes accessible to our palate for sweetness, which you can't taste if you just eat the flour, and it becomes accessible to the oven heat for caramelization. So there's a range. There's a, a pretty flexible range for uh, you know where the maximum sort of peak moments are. But uh, t- typically, if you're using refrigeration to slow things down, you've got a range of anywhere from you know 12 to 96 to 100 hours where you can hold that dough at a pretty good peak. And some people prefer four days. Some people we found in, in our experiments that you can pretty much get to a sort of a peak uh, flavored dough, dough and caramelization in about 24 to 36 hours is ideal. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of benefits in longer fermentation unless you're using a very high protein flour, which a lot of pizzerias do, high gluten flour, which can benefit from an extra day or two of fermentation because the proteins will relax. Or high hydration, as you mentioned, Brian, where uh, and, and and these pan pizza doughs are high hydration, but uh, some of them are even higher. Like uh, some of the new Roman pizzas, which is going to be the next big thing on the blog, um, are going up to 90% hydration. Yep. And the dough is so wet that you don't think it'll ever come together. But over a period of a couple of days with stretching and folding the dough, uh, it firms up and it becomes workable. And so, the, you know, some of the Roman guys feel that they need four to five days to get their dough to peak performance. And also they're using a type of flour that responds to that. I prefer to use, for my pizzas, I'm using American bread flours, whether it's, it, the brands can, don't even matter, they're all pretty good. Uh, so I won't throw out brand names, but any supermarket brand can work or any commercial brand that pizzerias can get will work. Um, I prefer unbleached flour to bleached because I think the flavor's better. I use unbromated, not bromated, even though New York pizza um, by the slice, folks believe bromated flour makes a better pizza. But I, I think the, the, the negatives on bromation uh, from a health standpoint are strong enough to say, I, I want my unbromated, and instead of bromate, uh, potassium bromate, I'll use flour that's been 
treated with uh, citric acid or something like that to do the same thing. So mm -hmm. there's ways around all that, but but unbleached does have better flavor. Bleached flour is very good, by the way, for biscuits, though, because it bonds better with butter. If I wanted to do like a, a 12 to 24 hour uh, a proof, but uh, I wanted that crumb structure light and airy with chucking in a handful of more yeast, do the trick. Now I know it's not going to get the flavor because it hasn't had the time to create extra, all those gluten strands. But. The extra yeast really it just accelerates the the uh, fermentation speed. It doesn't necessarily accelerate flavor development. Uh, if you'd like it to puff up a little bit more, add a little bit more hydration, an extra one or two or three percent water to the dough. And then as, the, as that water is evaporating during the bake, it's forcing the dough to expand more. And that's probably the best way rather than adding more yeast. Awesome. Hey, I wonder if you can settle this for me. And I've seen um, <clears throat> a lot of arguments and message boards and things like that about um, will salt kill your yeast? Yeah, from what I've, what I've studied on it, yeast is fairly encapsulated if you buy dry yeast. So if you act, if you've accidentally put your yeast and your salt in the mixer at the same time and they're sitting with each other, uh, it's not going to do much to it, at least not for a while, not until it gets wet. Now, if you were to put it in there and then pour some water on it and it gets wet, and then all of a sudden the salt is going to immediately attack the yeast. Because remember, salt is a preservative. And what is it preserving? It's killing microorganisms so that the food doesn't spoil. So, um, so as a habit, I tend to put the yeast on one side of the flour and the salt, you know, salt on the other side, just as a protection. Uh, right. But it's at the end of the world, if they touch a little bit at the beginning, you've got a few minutes of, uh, you know, uh, leeway uh, before that, that becomes a real problem. Um, so uh, then let's say we throw in the, the flour, yeast, and the water, instant yeast, let that start activating. Would you recommend holding the salt off until a few minutes after beginning That's mixing? That's a technique, an artisan baker's technique, and they call it auto-lease, where you mix the dough without the salt. Uh, and some, some people do it even without the yeast. They just want to get the dough wet and turned into a dough before they add the yeast and the salt. I tend to like to get the yeast in there right at the beginning. Uh, salt, uh, what will happen is if you wait and, let's say, mix the dough for a, to, to a certain point and then let it rest for 10 to 20 minutes, uh, the, the dough will look a little softer and slacker and wetter then it actually is where you want it to be. But as soon as you throw the salt in, it tightens up because salt has that effect of tightening gluten. Mm -hmm. And so the dough will come together. Uh, is there a big advantage? It depends on, on what time frame you're working on. If you're trying to make a dough on the same day and you just want it to be, you know, you don't want to, you don't, you're not going to hold it overnight. And so you want the hydration to happen more quickly, leave the salt out for 15, 20 minutes, because it will, the flour will hydrate more quickly and activate the yeast more quickly, and then the salt will come in. And then you have to give it at least two minutes when you add the salt to get it properly distributed. It's a little bit of a risk. And also the other risk is that people might forget to put the salt in. Yeah. <laughs> so that's probably the most common mistake in any bakery or you know pizzeria is forgetting either the salt or the yeast. So it's very important that, that the mixing person has a mise en place sort of system where everything's laid out and scaled ahead of time. You're not stopping midstream to go, oh, my God, i got to go scale my yeast or my salt. Get it all pre-scaled so and make sure it all gets in there. And, and whether you use the auto-lease technique of holding back the salt or not, uh, it really, for pizza doughs, I found it's not that critical. And especially if you're holding the dough overnight, the dough catches up overnight. The hydration, everything finishes up, you know, during the overnight cold fermentation. So it's not as critical a factor. Uh, but again, every baker has a system that they yep. love, and they're not going to fix it. They're not going to change it if it's working. Why fix it if it's not broken? Uh, unless somebody gives them a, a product that tastes even better, and they go, how come yours tastes better than mine? That's the only thing that's going to shake somebody free of their, of their system. But uh, most systems are pretty solid, and I think once you have one, it, it's not like one is better than the other. It's just that the system itself is your insurance policy that it's all going to turn out the way you want it to. Most of those can be saved, I, I found. Unless you oversalt, if you if you misscale the salt and put in you know more than you're supposed to put in, that's hard to fix. You you typically have to throw that out and start over. But if it's undersalted or or you forgot the yeast, those can be added later in the game. Okay. And save the, you can save the dough most of the time. When when I had my my uh, restaurant way back in the beginning uh, with my wife and we had uh, we had a twenty quart Hobart, and we would make cookies, two chocolate chip cookies. 
And uh, when I one time I was adding my chocolate chips at the end, you know, with the, the dough paddle, and I and I made the mistake of adding them with. In a, I had a glass beaker that I had I put them, like scaled them out, and I was pouring them in. And I uh, looked up to answer a question, and my hand dropped, and the mixing bowl, the mixer uh, paddle, grabbed the glass out of my hand and pulled it right into the mixer, and all of a sudden, this whole glass thing was crunch, crunch, crunch throughout. Oh. And, and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, the first thought in my mind was, is there any way I can get this glass out and save this? <laughs> I don't want to throw chocolate chips away. I don't want to throw this butter away. And I told, so, so of course, I threw, the, I threw it away and started over. But when the customers came and I told them what happened, I said, and I spent a whole hour pulling that glass out of these before I baked them for you. And I told them that while they were like halfway through a bite. And I saw them like totally freeze. And I said, gotcha. Well, yeah, no, I was jokingly going to say that, but I, I like that that's the first thing that went through your head. Is yeah. trying to get this glass out. <laughs> I know. It shouldn't have been, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I could sit and talk all that. I mean, there's so much that we haven't even touched on, which, I, you know, I, I highly recommend everybody going, going out and checking out um, your books. I do have like one or two more quick questions, but um, especially uh, Perfect Pan Pizza, it's the new one. It's been out since May. It's going to tell you how to make the, well, the Perfect Pan Pizza. Where, mm-hmm. where can people get these books, uh, all of your, your complete Peter Reinhardt library? Yeah. Well, I think most of them, I've done 12. A few of them are out of print now, some of my earlier ones. But my, all my books are available, obviously, on Amazon and those services. Uh, most bookstores, especially bookstores that specialize in culinary books, will have most of my books. Bread Baker's Apprentices. 17 years old now, but it's still selling like crazy. It's my most successful book, and it's really the complete bread baking course. Um, the American Pie has been out 15 years, and it's still you know selling really because it tells the journey of searching for like first defining what is a perfect pizza, and there really isn't one. It's perfect pizzas, you know, but what makes it perfect? And again, my definition is is it memorable or not? And what makes it memorable is what that book is about. And so there's lots of good recipes, starter recipes, um, but it's um, it's more the story of the journey. And then Pizza Quest, uh, pizza, if you go to pizzaquest.com or www.pizzaquest.com, um, then you can follow, you know, watch these videos. We've done some great videos with wonderful pizza makers like Nancy Silverton and Tony Gemignani and all the, you know, a lot of stars. We certainly many that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, and if anybody wants to write to me, just write to Peter at pizzaquest.com and I'll get your emails and you know we sometimes we just troubleshoot stuff over over an email well yeah that's great so that everybody knows where to get it now um I mean there's things like starter doughs uh, different types of yeast um there's a lot of information and you know that that would be a whole another three hour I know you got stuff to do but um yeah. you know with, they'll be able to find this in the August issue of PMQ Pizza Magazine and actually I think something in September as well about you. Fantastic. Um, so we're doing the chef's corner and then also a feature story on Peter because he's just got such a wealth of knowledge that we, you know, he was our, actually my first live interview in 2013. I remember. Um, yeah. And, uh, so that was very honored with that. And I'm glad that it's been a while. So I'm glad to get him back in the chef's corner here. So, you know, I just, on the, at the end here, I just want to say, what is the like the one place in baking when you were coming up that you can warn the readers about or listeners? Like a biggest mistake that you made, had to find out the hard way, and but were able to recover from something that you would just say, you're doing great, just always watch out for this. I think that for me, the single most important lesson is, and it's the first lesson we teach our culinary students, is the concept of mise en place, which means everything in its place in French, you know. But what it really means, I think, you know, in a more metaphorical sense is, is get organized. It's always better to start by first setting up your organization, your, 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 uh, your workspace. I'd say single most important uh, uh, suggestion for anybody, whether it's professional or amateur cooks, read the recipe and instructions completely first before you start to mix it. Because sometimes the way they're written you'll find that there's a critical piece of information further down and, you know, that should have been maybe moved up, but you didn't know that. And so read it first. And that, that's part of your mental mise en place is getting organized by reading it, gather your ingredients, and then you can start and you're less likely to make any mistakes. The mission of a baker is to evoke the full potential of flavor trapped in the flour, in the grain, because that's the main ingredient. And, and if, you, if you understand that's your mission, then everything else that you choose to do while you're following the instructions is for that purpose. You've got, a, you've got an outcome in mind. And all these steps 
are designed to get you there. So that way you can get your mind again around the whole process. You know where you're trying to get to. And then everything else is just the sort of the, the step-by-step method or what we call the MOP, the method of preparation that gets you there. So, uh, so that's step number one. And then, and then the second part is, is, is understanding when you're baking that it's, especially if it's breads, if it's with yeast and whether it's sourdough or commercial yeast, it's all about fermentation. So try to learn as much as you can about fermentation. It's a, it's the hottest category in the culinary world right now is, is the fermentation category, whether it's for breads, cheeses, uh, uh, vinegars, wine, beer, you name it. It's all about fermentation because fermented food is living food. And it's great to be able to participate in, a, in a, the drama of bringing something to life um, and then turning it into nourishment for other people or for yourself. And so you get joy, you know, both in the making and in the consuming. Well, Peter, I think I'm going to have to let you go. I do want to recommend everybody get Perfect Pan Pizza by Peter Reinhardt, uh, pizzaquest.com or on Amazon. I mean, there's things about naturally leavened dough. There's a resource guide in the back telling you, uh, you know, tools that you're going to need, all about the, just kind of, uh, just the glossary itself is a good read <laughs> right there. It's fun because the glossary is kind of like an FAQ. You know, when I'm working the, the, the the definitions I'm realizing these are answering a lot of questions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, there's a section on fermentation, dual formula. I, it's almost, I, I would almost recommend people read that first and then jump into, you know, that's you're right. It's kind of like mise en place. <laughs> thank <laughs> well, you. Peter, it's no, been great thank being with you and, and uh, look forward to doing it again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the recipe. Uh, thank you very much for your time and, and all the knowledge that you've been able to give our listeners and readers. Um, you guys can check this out in the August issue. Uh, the recipe is going to be printed in the August issue of PMQ Pizza Magazine. Uh, there will be an instructional video where I try to recreate Peter's magic. Oh, well, yeah. We'll see how I see At least I have a picture to go from. So Let me know when that's up. And if any of uh, our viewers here uh, you know, want to write to me again, peter at pizzaquest.com. I'd love to hear the results that they have if they try any of these things. And also, we're always looking for guest columnists for Pizza Quest. So if any, uh, anybody would like to do some writing, uh, write to me and I'll tell you how to you know, get, uh, get onto our guest columnist list and be a contributor to Pizza Quest. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's what I was noticing about this book, too, is that there is a lot of baking knowledge imparted in it. I mean, I guess you just can't get away from your old habits, but um, it's about pizza, but they're – big sections about why this dough is doing this or how to get it to do yeah. what you want it to do. So there's, it's a wealth of knowledge. Um, plus there's, you know, 11 other books. So, um, <laughs> pizza quest.com, you know, uh, you guys check it out on Amazon. Peter, thank you once again. Uh, that's all the time we have in the chef's corner today, guys. We really appreciate you guys sticking around and, uh, keep an eye out for, in August for Peter Reinhardt and PMQ Pizza Magazine. Thanks. Thank Peter. you. Thank you.